afternoon. It's an exciting day for the families and uh, certainly all those that have uh, signed national letters of intent to attend uh, the university of their choosing. But in particular, what we're focused on is uh, the 24 that have already signed here uh, at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, today is a celebration. Uh, for them and their families, a culmination, if you will, of the, the hard work both on and off the field. Um, and that celebration is that they will be attending the University of Notre Dame. And uh, it certainly has been a long process, uh, not only for the student athletes and their families, the countless hours of sacrifice and dedication to their sons uh, to put them uh, in a position to be where they are today, uh, but certainly uh, the start of an exciting journey. Uh, as I was saying today, it is a celebration, but it shouldn't be the highlight uh, of their career moving forward, National Signing Day. Um, it's been a journey for Notre Dame and our recruiting efforts. A year ago, um, we made some substantial changes within our recruiting office. It started with uh, uh, me handing the reins over to Mike Elston uh, on my staff uh, as the recruiting coordinator uh, and asking him to reshape uh, the look of our recruiting efforts. And I think in a very short period of time, uh, he's done a, uh, a, a, a very um, admirable job, but more importantly, a very creative job. Uh, one that has uh, addressed the needs that we have within recruiting, but has also embraced um, what recruiting looks like right now and moving forward. Uh, to do that, we've had to put together a staff, and I think uh, we've, we've put together a great staff in our recruiting office led by uh, Aaron Kearney has done a great job. Aaron has, has really led our office uh, in, in the recruiting organization uh, and developed the, uh, the whole um, you know, spearhead of this recruiting effort in 16 and moving forward in 17. Uh, Jasmine Johnson, a Notre Dame grad, uh, has been incredible in her work on campus and uh, certainly working with our ambassadors here. Uh, but both of them in particular uh, have been instrumental uh, and changing the face of our recruiting. Um, I think uh, Luke Pitcher's done a great job in, in creating uh, the stories to be told uh, relative to social media and graphics. Um, and in particular, that office now has got great momentum and great synergy that has helped us get to the point that we are at today. Um, Dave Poloquin is has been a mainstay here at Notre Dame and is continued in his role of managing our roster. And it's so important as we continue to move forward, Dave has created and forged great relationships with everybody in the recruiting area, those that work in that medium, uh, as well as those that are on campus that provide us with the sources of information necessary for us to be strategic in our recruiting, who we're recruiting, where we're recruiting, what positions that we're recruiting. And Dave managing that 85-man roster has helped us uh, incredibly, but um, in his role, he's been invaluable in putting together uh, a great plan in 16 and, and moving forward. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about uh, some of the highlights uh, from this year, we look back and start with the Irish invasion. Uh, we did an inventory of the Irish invasion that we had uh, and the number of scholarship players that came out of that uh, is staggering. Those that were offered, those that were committed to us, those that got scholarship offers uh, that we're still recruiting. Um, those kinds of events don't just happen by chance. Um, they take a lot of preparation organization, and, and uh, those that I've mentioned were instrumental uh, in organizing and, and putting that together. Um, our recruiting office will continue to grow, uh, move forward. We'll have some more exciting announcements as we continue to uh, find the best and the brightest. We're stealing talent wherever we find it. We just stole some more talent on campus. We can't announce her yet, but uh, you're going to be quite familiar with her. You see her on campus quite a bit, but uh, she'll be joining our office here pretty soon. Once we get the, uh, the signatures on her high-paid contract, we'll announce her as well. 
Um, but uh, we're excited about the future and where we're moving forward uh, relative to our recruiting office. A uh, number of thank yous, uh, certainly to the assistant coaches uh, for their work. As you know, uh, this is a national brand uh, that requires our coaches to go coast to coast. Probably a bigger thank you to their wives um, for uh, picking up uh, a large part of the slack, if you will, uh, while they're on the road uh, quite a bit of the time uh, going from coast to coast. Uh, recruiting uh, young men to come to Notre Dame. But uh, a great job by our coaches uh, geographically within their areas. And then obviously what we do a very, very good job of is supplementing those geographical recruiting areas uh, with the assistant coaches going in there, uh, supplementing with with the position coach being there, the coordinators being there, cutting across all over the country. You don't just stay in a particular area. You've got to be able to go coast to coast as well. So uh, our assistant coaches did a terrific job and, and their families, uh, they sacrifice a lot and want to thank them. When they come to campus, there's so many people that are involved from our admissions and Bob Monday and Dom Bishop who meet with our kids. I mean, it is important uh, that, that when we bring somebody on campus that they must do a great job in those interviews with Bob Monday and Dom Bishop. Uh, it is an important component uh, to being able to, to be admitted here at Notre Dame. And they know our players. They, they know who they are. Uh, and I want to thank our admissions office and then those two individuals in particular for the work that they do. But our athletic director is involved in that. And, and that's kind of unusual, I would tell you, that an athletic director makes himself available. I want to thank Jack in particular for his work in this recruiting process of being available, just making himself available with the kind of schedule that he has to meet individually with our recruits and their families. Says so much about the commitment from top down. When you get a chance to talk to a parent that's met with the athletic director, they know that all things are working together and, and that they can feel comfortable that they know that there is a continuity and that there is a, uh, a clear message that is across the board uh, that their sons are going to hear every single day. Uh, everybody's in lockstep and when you have your athletic director supporting that, uh, that is a big plus in the recruiting process for us. Adam Sargent, uh, who uh, in our academic support team does such a great job, but Adam in particular spends countless days here, but on the weekends as well. Um, gives up his time from being with his family to be here and talk about how important it is uh, to be organized and to be focused and what to expect relative to when you come to Notre Dame, uh, the resources that you'll have to take advantage. And you have to put your pride aside and ask for help and ask for assistance in coming to Notre Dame. And, and Adam and his staff uh, do, do an incredible job. You've got to be able to promote that. And Dan Skedden, Dan Skenzel and his staff um, through Irish, uh, Fighting Irish Media and Digital Media do a great job of, of giving them that picture. And, and it's, it's, it's so uh, vivid when we get a chance to put that um, in action and, and using uh, that medium really tells a great story. And, and Dan and his staff are uh, part of what's happened today here, taking it to that next level. And uh, I can't thank Dan enough and his staff. Um, Eric King and the facility staff. We got to keep this place clean, uh, and and uh, it's it's not easy with uh, 105 football players hanging around here all the time. And and Eric does that plus provides us with the facilities, is juggling it all the time. Uh, we are in a uh, uh, we we are chock full of teams in here. It's very busy. And, and he's scheduling and making this facility available for us to recruit in. And I don't know how he does it uh, with all the teams. We're bursting uh, with teams in here. Uh, we, need, we need at least two more facilities like this. Uh, is everybody hearing that? You can write that down. Um, but we need more facilities, and, and Eric does a great job of balancing all those things and, and gets us the, the time that we, we need in here. Um, but, you know, 
last but not least, all of our student ambassadors, our student workers, the, they do such a great job on a day-to-day -day basis to provide us uh, with the resources and the, and the management of this day. Uh, our student workers, if we didn't have them, it, I'll tell you what, the brain power that we have up there in our recruiting office is amazing. Just by tapping into our Notre Dame students, um, just in the recruiting end of things. You know, we have uh, really a think tank up there, and, and we, we actively engage our student uh, workers uh, in our recruiting office to come up with ideas. Uh, they are so savvy, so smart. Um, we steal such great ideas on a day-to-day -day basis from our students uh, as it relates to what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis in the recruiting end of things. And it's, uh, they're great at giving us feedback. They help us in the recruiting. Uh, and, they're, and they're integral to, to what we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, think, I think, again, um, you know, from my, my standpoint, there's so many people that I can thank. But it starts with the restructuring. It starts with, um, again, having a vision for where we wanted to take our recruiting efforts. Uh, last year, Mike Elson's done a great job. And with that team that we've put together, um, we're not going to look back. It's only going to get better. So with that, we'll open it up to questions. The whole class is injury free. No injuries that we know of. Brian. The restructuring of your recruiting staff, both the recruiting coordinator, but the support staff upstairs. At what point in this cycle did you feel like that was back up to speed? Because it's certainly when you're watching relationships walk out the door and go to other staffs. How long did that take before you felt comfortable about where things were going? I would use the Irish invasion uh, and, the, and those that were at that event and the kind of talent that was recruited to that event um, and then the organization of that day. So um, it was pretty evident for me that, that we had it going once we got back from our May recruiting cycle uh, that we had a pretty good energy in that office. And then it was solidified in my mind after the Irish invasion and the creativity that we were kind of building on at that point that we were moving in a, uh, a very good direction. The organizational aspect that Mike Elston has brought to that department uh, in terms of his personality and the way he goes about his business, what changes for the positive do you think that's really brought to that operation? Well, I think in the recruiting end of things, it's, it's the combination of attention to detail, not being afraid to hear the word no and keep plowing through no's early on in this recruiting process. There's no area that we're not afraid to get into um, and afraid to take a shot at in this recruiting process, um, making sure that we're highlighting who we are and our distinctions and using all platforms to reach the student athletes that we're talking about recruiting and all platforms from you know Instagram to Twitter, um, all platforms, not just mailings. Um, and, and I think that that has really uh, been the impetus in terms of us moving quicker uh, and getting into uh, areas that maybe we were slower in, in touching in the recruiting process. What was the genesis of the uh, semi-truck? Where did that when did that seed first get planted for you? Well, you know, as, as, as we get into the last few days of recruiting, it really becomes babysitting. And, and I, we were of the opinion that we were tired of babysitting and, and, you know, just putting a guy in a geographical area just to sit there and, what are you going to talk about? You know, it's like you want to send the family home. You know, Christmas is over. You're tired of talking about the same stories, right? Send the relatives home. It's the same thing. The last few days of recruiting, I don't know what to talk about anymore. And so we said, well, maybe we can create a buzz by talking about a truck that has a tradition on it. And so we followed the, the, the rules. We drove it there and parked it in front. And it seemed to be a better story than, than anything else that we could create at that time. So who came up with that idea? That was Mike Elson. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yep, Mike's, Mike's got the creative end of things, and then uh, he, he runs that through. The first thing we do is we call on Jen Vining Smith, and uh, we run it through compliance, and, um, you know, we, we, get, we get an okay through compliance, and then we'll, we'll, he'll run it by me and, and feel what my temperature is on it, and then we'll go with it. 
Brian, you touched on Irish Invasion, and Mike Elson mentioned earlier that the date for that's already locked in. You guys have already locked in Junior Day dates. That whole is all or organized better than it has been in the past. Where do you see Irish Invasion going from here? How can you continue to evolve that? Well, I think what we're trying to do, obviously, is, for example, we had a number of uh, those players in Irish Invasion in 17 um, come out of that that event and, and be guys that were on early. We want to use that Irish invasion as something as a step towards a year to two years out. And so we think that that is uh, the future stars uh, for Notre Dame, if you will. It's not the immediate stars that are coming on campus, but I think Irish invasion is, look what's going to be coming in the future as well. So it's your futures game. It's your futures that are coming uh, on campus at that time as well. So it really is seen uh, in some instances as maybe you're making a decision on a couple of kids for 16, but it's really a, about the future of what your recruiting efforts should be looking at moving forward. Those type of camps, summer camps, are something that other programs have done over the years, the big time events. Was that something you targeted early when you got here that you wanted to try and develop something like that at Notre Dame? Well, I think it was really finding what was most important in the recruiting process to get that chain uh, moving in favor of that yes. And what we now know definitively is that we have to get you on campus in the summer months to move favorably towards that decision to come to Notre Dame. So that camp is very, very important to get you on this campus. Uh, you really can't truly get to that yes, in our opinion, uh, if you're reading about Notre Dame on the internet. You, you've got to get on this campus. So uh, I think what we learned in our first couple of years is that you can go out and recruit in May and you can talk about Notre Dame and you can talk about how this is what you're going to get at Notre Dame. You got to get them on campus, and we use that Irish invasion as a great opportunity to get them on campus. I wanted to ask about quarterback recruiting. Yep, it's, it's so much different. It seems like than any other position. How has it changed and evolved to where you guys are now offering kids, which you obviously can't talk about, but way out into you know maybe the 18 or 19 class now? Well, I think it's like anything else. I mean. Look, if, if, if your son uh, aced his PSATs, he's going to get some mail from Harvard and Stanford, right, when he's a ninth grader. Um, and, and he should, right? It's the same thing. If, if you're an incredible ninth grader or tenth grader and, and you are somebody that is elite, and there are just a few of them, um, they, they need to hear from you. And uh, that doesn't mean it's across the board, but that's just – where that position, the quarterback position, is so central to the success of football teams that I think you're going to see that kind of recruitment at that position moving forward. They've got to be elite, uh, but I think that you're going to continue to see that kind of recruitment at that position. And what's the evaluation process for you as the head coach when it comes to younger guys at that position in particular? Not as interested in, in the camp stuff as I am uh, what he's doing in games, how he performs late in games, does he move his football team late in games, can he rally the troops, um, look how he even performs when his team is down. I'm more interested in game uh, mechanics, dynamics. Um, you should be able to complete every pass if you don't have a pass rush. So uh, although it's nice to see what um, arm strength and those things are, uh, there'd be a big, big criteria on playing the game itself. Thanks. Yeah. Brian, this was Todd's first real recruiting cycle as a coach. You guys go out and sign seven DBs. What sort of worked for him? What did he find that worked? What do you think he find that maybe didn't work going out and recruiting for the first time? I think Todd found that there's there's a big difference between being in the NFL and, and certainly being in college. And um, it's a learning process. I think uh, Todd's obviously uh, learned a lot in his first year. Um, but I, I think he also, he leaned heavily on those that were experienced. Um, uh, I think that, that we used all of our coaches geographically and by position uh, to assist all the coaches in, in uh, all of the recruiting efforts. Autry Denson was instrumental. Um, Coach Van Gorder was instrumental. Uh, Mike Elston. Uh, we all, I think, helped each other 
in this first year, um, especially with Todd, um, you know, really being the uh, first year in, in college full time and really getting out on the road. He has such a story to tell. He's so dynamic as a personality. He can articulate Notre Dame very well. Uh, but it was his first time, you know, out on the road. So we wanted to make sure that we provided him uh, with coaches that, that had been down there before, if you will. And, and that's kind of how we went about it. It's kind of feeding off of that. The staff turnover last year and then how quickly things got streamlined, is that something that you're able to do when you're five, six years into a program as opposed to maybe one or two years? Yeah, well, it, it definitely helps when, when you know exactly what you're looking for. And, and I think you're probably scrambling a little bit more in your first couple of years because you're still kind of figuring out, you know, what's your profile? How are we going to go about doing this, right? So we had a clear mandate as to how we recruit here. So that was easier to articulate. Uh, and then just it's a matter of putting the right pieces and the right people on the staff. I know you didn't do the Showtime series necessarily for the recruiting payoff, but what sort of tangible payoffs now that this class is signed did you see from going into kids' homes who said, hey, I saw the Showtime series or their parents saw it? I just think the way um, a student athlete, um, you know, lives his life here at Notre Dame, you know, the day-to-day. -day. And, um, you know, I, we, we didn't do it to try to – change those that don't like Notre Dame or, or are not fans of Notre Dame. We want them to respect who we are and, and what our student athletes do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think more than anything else, I think it gave them insight as to what their day is like and who they are. And I think, if anything, we, we were able to gain a lot of respect from those uh, that saw what the student athletes do on a day-to-day -day basis. This was the first time in your seven-year recruiting cycle you did not have a decommit, so to speak, from somebody. And usually you've had like sometimes a minimum of three and even more. Mike Elston kind of credited it to having a more of a well-rounded team effort. How do you balance having so many coaches involved in the recruiting with also not overwhelming them so much? Yeah. Well, I, I think that there, there's a number of things going on here. I think first and foremost, uh, all coaches, all the entire staff uh, having a consistent message. And, and that message being, uh, you know, one of who we are and, and what we're about and, and never swaying from that. So, for example, if you have three different coaches that, that go to recruit you and you get three different messages, there's some uncertainty as to what I'm getting myself into. But if all three coaches come in and you hear the same thing, you know what you're getting. That lessens the, the wavering of a student athlete. So I think first and foremost, we had a unified staff, a clear message. Mike did a great job of taking my message and reinforcing it every single day. There was a consistency in terms of what the message was. That's number one. I think number two is that we vetted out uh, better than we ever have because we were further out on, on our recruits in terms of time. We had more time with them to make sure that they were um, kids that, that would fit here at Notre Dame. I think those two things stand out for me that we didn't have the kind of, you know, back and forth. Much was made about your six-year extension deal. Did you feel that was necessary also on the recruiting trail? Do you, have you found yourself many times on the trail being asked, well, we hear all the time you're going to the NFL or this or that. Uh, you get it once in a while. It wasn't pervasive. It wasn't something that we felt like we had to recruit a, around because, you know, those, quite frankly, those come up, you know, virtually tall coaches that are having some success. So it wasn't big, but certainly um, any time that you can make that announcement that there's continuity within your program for six more years, it certainly, it, it, it serves you well in the recruiting process. But I don't believe at any time it became a hindrance uh, and, and it, it became something that, oh, we, we got to announce this to hold on to five or six kids in our class. Um, it, it, was, it, it was certainly timely. There's no question about it. It helps. But we didn't think we needed to make an announcement because uh, we had a, uh, a great amount of uncertainty about me being here at Notre Dame. I mentioned that uh, you had no decommitments, but you did pick up seven commitments from people who had already committed to other schools. How do you get a read or gauge 
as to when someone would be available? Uh, well, I, I think, look, when, when we talk about Notre Dame, it either hits their brain or it doesn't. I mean, when we talk about what our distinctions are and we talk about living on campus and we talk about li you don't live in a football dorm and we talk about the spirituality of our campus, if he starts twiddling his fingers and looking the other way, we're moving on. <laughs> but if it resonates, we know. And so when we tell our story, and it's our story about who we are truly, um, it's pretty easy to know uh, who that resonates with. And if it resonates with them and the family and they understand it, um, we're all in. We're going to recruit you. If it doesn't, we're moving on to the next guy. And sorry for getting a little ahead here, but uh, given what you've been able to sign in these last two cycles, as you look into the 2017 group, Where's your point of emphasis? Uh, we'll get some offensive to... linemen. Probably our biggest need is to go back onto the offensive line. We'll go back there. Um, and then I think we've put ourselves now in a position of balance. And, and then we'll have to look at uh, balancing all position groups. But O-line, we're going to have to fill that back up a little bit more. Um, and then uh, look at all position groups and and – you know, uh, one of the things you have to do now, Lou, is you got to look at and anticipate any juniors that may leave. You know, I think it's a reality today in the recruiting process, not just seniors, juniors and seniors. So we'll evaluate that, and then it just becomes making sure that you're balanced at all position groups. Brian, what do you think is the biggest need this class fills for you? Certainly the, uh, the safety corner, third corner position uh, on, on our defense. Um, you know, the potential of some third down uh, specialists, the, the potential for uh, guys to rust the passer, you know, certainly the nickel position um, and, and safety. I, I think those, those in particular, um, you know, we may have some help, um, you know, at some skill positions on offense, maybe, some, maybe a too deep guy on the offensive line, possibly. Um, but I would say primarily your eyes would move immediately towards uh, the back end of the defense uh, and maybe situationally there could be a third down player in there um, to help us on defense. Just kind of following on that, uh, I know you're not in the habit of giving away positions that has to be earned, but looking at the list, who do you see as the player most likely to have an impact next year or the play couple of players? To well, again, I, I think you always you always begin to look at those guys that don't have to, you know, bench 375 pounds right away, you know, and, and physically those guys that, you know, are tough mentally and physically and, and uh, have a short memory, you know, the corners, you know, certainly can come in and, and, and compete. And we, we've got a number of guys that have a high skill level at that position or we wouldn't have recruited them. So all those corners, I, I think the safety Safeties are all capable of coming in and competing uh, for playing time. So, uh, you know, if I was, you know, if I was saying, where, where do you think it'll happen from? I would, I would naturally look towards that group right away. But you know, you got some, you got some big linemen too. You know, and some extraordinarily gifted players at the linebacker position. So I, I wouldn't rule them out, but. Be just just by the pure number of having seven in the back end of the defense, it's probably a good shot that somebody's coming out of that group. Uh, early in the process, it seemed like Devin Studsill and Jalen Elliott became priorities for your staff, and, and you guys made a push for them. What was it about those two kids that you saw that really made made them such – priorities for your staff? Well, Jalen Elliott competed like no player that I have seen since I've been coaching uh, in a camp setting. And, and that's over 25 years. His competitive spirit was unmatched. Um, it was, it was un, unparalleled in terms of, I can't remember a guy, maybe there, there was one guy that competed on the offensive line for me at Cincinnati in a camp that was similar. But this kid competed at every position at such a level that he was a, he was a can't miss guy for us in the recruiting process. Same thing with Devin Studsill. His skill level uh, was of corner-like ability, but had the size of the safety. And so 
our eyes went right to them early on and that was a focal point because we got a chance to see them up close and personal and saw their characteristics, their traits, the way they competed, the way they interacted. Um, they didn't say a word, they just went and competed. You've talked a lot, well we've asked you a few questions about pass rush here in this office or in these rooms a few times. Um, do you feel like the two kids you got Julian Akwara and, and Khalid Kareem can kind of take a step towards maybe finding a little bit of that four-man answer? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking strictly four-man, you know, you know, you're going to look towards those guys. Um, you know, I, I think there's some other potentials for that as well uh, in this class. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time. But we're pretty excited about the potential for some guys in this class that can answer some four-man uh, pass rush uh, needs that we do have. But... I think we all know that um, you know pass rushes are, are, are you know really a, about the product of what you're doing defensively in so many other different areas, whether it's a, a corner blitz or a safety or a linebacker. Uh, but if you're talking strictly four down, th those would be guys that we would want to develop there, sure. Second year in a row, you signed a, a deep, talented group of receivers. They're they're going to enter the team with a little bit different situation. There's no Will Fuller. There's no Chris Brown and Amir Carlisle. Um, do, do, are, are these kind of guys that you see coming in and being able to push the, group, the guys ahead of them and maybe you know, give yourself a, some depth and some guys can come in and have an impact right away? I think that the, the wide receiver position has always been, as we continue to accelerate the position each and every year, is one where you should come in with the mindset that I'm going to be the starter. Uh, we've already seen it. You know, Will Fuller played two years here, really, if you want to break it down. He, didn't, he had a... He had a cameo his first year here and then really played two years. So why wait around? If you're really that good, you may not be here very long. We hope that you're here for four years um, and, and you stay. Um, but you got to be ready to compete. And so our expectation in the recruiting process is for the wide receiver group is to come in and compete to get on the field and, and, and you know, be a player for us immediately. So that's the mindset. And then last one for me, Jonathan Jones obviously doesn't fit the measurables that a lot of people t tend to look for, but he was a guy that seemed for a long time was a guy that your staff, multiple coaches went after. What was it you guys saw in him as far as how he can fit in, into what you do defensively? Just uh, great instincts, you know. Um, physically, uh, maybe his, his, his lack of height, you know, scared some people away. Um, but just great instincts as a linebacker, great leadership quality, uh, physically strong, fit, athletic, um, and, and has a great awareness in the, in the pass game as well. Uh, just for us, just looked like the consummate linebacker, had all that, you know, um, innate ability and, and football recognition that you don't have to teach. Coach, uh, what's it like going through a signing day where there's relatively no drama? Which... It's awesome. I think that uh, everybody should try it once in their career. Um, there's no drama because I think we did a great job of knowing and, and really um, getting to know our guys, who we were signing, why they were coming to Notre Dame, and really asking the questions. You know, is this the right place for you? We don't want you to commit unless you're totally invested. And we say this to them, if you want to keep taking visits, go take visits, then you're not committed to Notre Dame. Then keep taking visits. If you're committed, shut down the recruiting process. And then if you're ready to commit, make a commitment. Instead of saying, you know, keep going, take other visits. Um, so I think that's important in, in this process. You know, you know, we, we uh, you know, we have this word commitment, but I don't know that, that we hit it hard enough. So we hit it pretty hard with those kids, and, and I think it's, it's, it's served us well on days like today. And was McKinley, I guess, the closest thing to drama because 1130, you guys, everything was going perfectly, and his papers just weren't in yet? Well, we went 
uh, we, we went with technology. I don't know if you know this. We went with CUDA sign uh, this year, so we didn't have any faxes. So everything was done on a smartphone, uh, and um, his smartphone wasn't smart today. So we had some we had some technical problems, but um, uh, we we we're proud to announce that we did not use the fax machine today. So we've entered the 21st century. Uh, here at Notre Dame. Um, so we had a little technical issue, but we weren't afraid or, or concerned. And offensive line, obviously two of your top three recruits are on that. Can you just uh, speak up how important that is to kind of reload in that area? Well, you got P money. Everybody knows P money, right? If you don't know P money, then you guys, come on, really? Get a Twitter account. Um, so P Money, obviously a big physical inside guy, Parker Boudreaux, uh, and you know has that physical presence inside. Like a, you know, I'm not comparing him, but he's a Quentin Nelson in terms of size and physicality. Uh, and then two edge guys that, um, you know, with 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 Liam and 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 Tommy on the outside. Those two kids are as good as you're going to find in the country. Um, and couldn't be more excited to have. You know, two kids from the state of Ohio, from two great Catholic schools in St. Ignatius and Cincinnati Elder uh, High School from the state of Ohio. And to get uh, Aquara and Jones having two uh, guys who obviously have brothers in the system, the continuity there, how much does that help, I guess, having that legacy? I think it's great. I think we, we recruited them the right way. We didn't recruit them because their brothers were here. We recruited them because we thought that they uh, were players that fit here at Notre Dame that would be very successful. Um, but obviously, it, it helps when their their brothers have a great experience here and um, you know really enjoy their their Notre Dame experience as as a student and as an athlete. Um, so that helps you in the recruiting. It could hurt you if they don't have a good experience, but uh, they had a great experience, and, and then those kids really fit uh, and can stand on their own two feet. And finally, for me, it seemed like you enjoyed your experience being in this room alone to uh, make the announcements of the players for the Watch ND videos. Just wondering if you have a future as an NFL commissioner. Uh, I, uh, I enjoy, I en for a draft I enjoy being in a room by myself, yes. <laughs> Brian, you referenced the Irish invasion earlier. You know, with the recruiting calendar getting moved so far up, kids making decisions so much earlier, beyond the Irish invasion, are you restructuring the way you do unofficial visits? Are you restructuring junior days and so forth to reflect that change? Yeah, June, uh, what was it, uh, January 23rd, junior day, you know, earliest that we've ever had. I think, you know, accelerating junior days, getting kids on campus earlier in January, I think is part of that as well. Uh, I think you're right, the calendar has moved up, so you've got to adjust to that accordingly. Um, so we're balancing 16s and 17s. But as you get more kids committed, and, and guys that you know you feel really good about, you still have to recruit them, then you can start to move into those junior days a lot sooner. And, and this is the first year we felt really good that we've moved this thing up to the point where we can bring those 17s on campus in January, uh, and that's gonna serve us well as we continue to move forward. Dalen Hayes, to me, is kind of a fascinating guy that he didn't play a lot of high school football but has such high potential, Yeah, and yet, could play a lot of different positions. Why did you settle on him as a defensive end? What do you think his ceiling looks like? We're really excited about him. He's a bright, articulate kid. He knows what he wants. The thing I like about Dalen more than anything else is um, he if you give him something that is really definitive and tangible, he's going to go after it. And and it's a, it, it's an approach that I love about a kid at that age. Um, and he'll work towards that. And whatever it's been, you know, I want to be a mid-year enrollee. Uh, I want to go to Notre Dame. Once he had settled on that, there was nothing that was going to get in the way of it. And um, that's why we're going to really enjoy uh, – uh, coaching him and his experience. Um, we just feel like, you know, with the shoulder surgery, uh, he hasn't really been able to weight train. He's already a pretty big kid. He's only going to get bigger. Um, we just think that he has such a um, such a range of positions that he can play. We're just going to kind of let it naturally happen. And where there's an area that that he can help us, I think we all know that getting after the quarterback would be a, a great start for him. 
I know Al Lesser badgered you a lot about your defense during the season. I didn't read any of it. <laughs> no. I, I'm sure I asked you about it a lot. <laughs> I wondered what kind of questions recruits had about your defense and how you sold the future of your defense to them. Well, I, I didn't have to sell it. I, I've got a great defensive coordinator, Brian Van Gorder. Um, great experience as, you know, former Broyles Award winner, as the outstanding uh, assistant coach in the country. Um, look, we, we made a pretty substantial change in defensive philosophy from a 3-4, two-gapping defense that played cover two to a 4-3 attacking defense that played cover one. That's a huge change, and it requires a bit of a transition. As we were transitioning, and we were winning some football games along the way. We're not where we want to be defensively, and we're not going to apologize for the fact that, you know, we had injuries. We had injuries, but um, we're going to play great defense under Brian Van Gorder and the staff that we've put together. So uh, it was an opportunity to play um, at Notre Dame, uh, under a coach that, that has had great success coaching football at the college level and the NFL level, and an opportunity a great opportunity as, as evidenced by the seven defensive backs that we were able to encourage to come to Notre Dame. I know that with kids that are looking at Notre Dame, you know, academics is at the top or near the top of their list, but the NFL dream is part of what, why they want to come to Notre Dame too. I'm wondering, do, does the early entries into the NFL draft, does that give you a bounce at all with that? Does that help you sell the player development type piece when you, especially with a guy like Will Fuller that wasn't a five star coming out of high school? Yeah, our player development is well chronicled. Their NFL people know that they're going to be developed here. They've seen how uh, that, so that word's out there and we're getting credit for it in, in the circles that if you want to listen in that room and hear that, you'll hear it. Um, so I don't know that we go around and we, we don't pound our chest about that, but I think it's pretty evident if you want to get into that conversation. If, for example, one school wants to say Notre Dame can't do that or doesn't do it, we could have a really, really good conversation about how we have done that. We prefer not to. Uh, we think we've got other things that are higher on the list. Um, but when we do get to that, and we do, further down the line, uh, we will highlight the guys that have developed and succeeded uh, in the NFL uh, and developed in this program in particular over the last six years. Good. Go ahead. Brian, you guys went up into Canada to get Chase Claypool. You don't sign a guy from Canada every year. What was it like going up there to get him in that recruiting process? And do you think the fact that he was from Canada maybe obscured him and his talents? Because I think he's a pretty talented Oh, He's player. averaging 49.2 points per game in basketball. So Mike Bray couldn't get him. So I went and got him for Mike. Uh, he's really a basketball player. He doesn't play football. But Mike has promised me to get a football player. Um, he's a heck of a – have you watched his basketball highlights? It's pretty good. He's an extraordinary kid. Um, Mike Dembrock and I have a contact in Canada that we've used – Ever since I've been back at Grand Valley in Central Michigan, I had some great success at Central recruiting some kids from Canada. And, and this same contact um, got in touch with us about Chase and said, look, I got a kid. I go, I'm not going to Canada. I got, I got enough states here that we could find a player. And then when we got a chance to see him play, we were just, just drawn to his pure physical ability. And then we loved him in person. We just loved his want to, um, his just, I guess, he's a blank slate. He's so raw that we're going to be able to create a player that could play so many different positions for us. So we're really excited about him. And it was beautiful country up there as well. Now, coaches dancing has become a fad in recruiting. Yeah, my son said if I do the dab, he will never forgive me. So, so, so you don't, you're not working on any dance moves for the future? You're not, that's not well, a national champ, when we win a national championship, I'll do something that is so creative that no one's ever done before. <laughs> so you'll have to wait for that one. But no dabbing. Thanks, Brian. Yes. Down in front, playing off that, has recruiting become more crazy, or are we just finding out about some of these stories? I mean, guys climbing trees and, and sending the truck and, and things like that. It just seems like people need to make a splash now to get these kids' attention. Well, you know, I guess, you know, Twittersphere has uh, something to do with that. You know, what's, what's going to jump out at you that changes the, you know, uh, the, what's being talked about, you know? Um, 
But, you know, we're not going to do anything hokey or crazy. Um, I, I think you still have to recruit kids um, and, and be upfront about who you are. And, and it's still about work and developing relationships. You're not going to get a kid because you sent the truck down there. Um, you know, you got it. We, we did that to break up the monotony of the recruiting at the end of the cycle. Um, so uh, it's, it's still about relationships. It's still about hard work. It's still about doing the things necessary uh, to get the right kids. But um, I, there's just a little bit more transparency uh, in it. That's about it. How would you like to characterize this group three or four years from now? It um, uh, doesn't seem like a flashy group, but um, you, you never know how they're going to turn out. Well, I think each and every year you, you hope that this group is the best group you've ever recruited. I'm hoping for that again. Um, I think we all know that, that there are some players in here that could help immediately, some that will develop, uh, and some that are in here for specific needs. So I think it touches upon everything that you would need in your program six years into it. It's not a immediate fix. It's not just for the future. I think it covers all the areas that you would expect it to cover, and that's why it doesn't kind of have that flashiness. But I will say this, it's a close group of guys. Uh, they know each other, they've stayed in contact with each other, and the great thing about that is that that will will be a strong pull in the locker room. This will be a close group that will stick together and that will fight through adversity, which you're always going to have in a team sport. And, and just one question off recruiting, but uh, it's been a little while since the bowl game. Uh, an update on Jalen Smith and, and how he's doing? Yeah, we had a conversation with him uh, earlier in the week. Um, he's really excited about his progress. He's making great progress. He feels like he's a couple of weeks ahead of it uh, from where they were expecting him to be. He expects to be uh, at the combine, not testing, but to be open for interviews and to do interviews. So uh, real positive news on, on the Jalen Smith front. Hey Brian, up here. When did you first start to notice social media have a real effect on recruiting and your job as well? On my job? Uh, from when I first stepped on this campus. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, just in your career as a coach, when did yeah. you first notice social media have that effect? Um, I'd say a couple years ago where it started to really heighten uh, to the point where, you know, you really had to pay attention to uh, what kids were doing on social media. A couple of years ago, kids were putting themselves in a tough position on social media. They weren't aware that what they were saying was actually being monitored. Kids have cleaned up what they say. Uh, they've blocked th those that can follow them. You know, they're so much more savvier, if you will, and they're using it so much more as a promotional uh, piece than it is, um, you know, something that could cast them in a negative light, if you will. So uh, it's a couple years. Twitter's changed dramatically, uh, the recruiting end of things, but I think it's been a couple years now, and, and following it is important. What were some of the focuses in this last recruiting cycle that, that your staff had specifically with social media and how to take advantage of it? Uh, getting our messages out, not through just mass mailings, but through you know, using social media as, as a conduit for that, whether it be, you know, uh, Vine or, or you know, in, any kind of video, streaming video that we could use, any kind of, um, you know, DMing uh, obviously is important to us uh, as, as a form of communication as we can't, you know, obviously use, um, you know, texting in, in the football end of things, we're unlike basketball. So, you know, those, those forms are very important to football. And then lastly, how has National Signing Day as an event changed since you first got onto the scene as a coach? Can you remember back to your first one? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, think when, when, when I was doing it, you know, we were, we were always doing what the cumulative GPA of the group was. You know, we always want to make sure we told everybody what, how good our GPA was. And, and then I figured that that really didn't matter it's just how many games you won. Um, so uh, I think it's changed a lot. It's about the quality of kid. It's not the GPA. It's the kind of kid, how he represents your university. Um, and, and that's much more important than, you know, what the, the, the GPA rounds out to be. It's what kind of kid you've got representing your university. Thanks. All right. That will conclude today. Thank awesome. you, everybody. Thank you for being here.